All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Friday. Uh, as our spring is starting to come to a close, we have a couple days left. And, uh, you know, I, I am just, uh, I, I, I guess the anal analogy I'll use today is I kind of feel like a kid at Christmas where I am anxious to hear what Adele Abrams has to say because this emergency temporary standard uh, that OSHA has issued is right here, right now. And we need to understand it and have a good grasp of it. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear her explanation of the word temporary. What does that mean? <laughs> but I want to tell you something. And I, I always uh, am very enlightened after I listen to Adele talk because Adele is not only an attorney, she is a safety professional. And she does a very good detailed analysis of safety issues that come up. And uh, you know what? I don't want to waste any more time. I just want to say thank you, Adele. She is the CEO of the Chesapeake Region Safety Council, and that's who we are. Our mission is to educate and influence people to prevent accidental injury and death. And uh, we have an opportunity to do one of our Friday freebies because we have Adele Abrams. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to Adele and let you have at it. So go for it, Adele. Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. And good morning to everybody. And uh, Dave, Dave is not just engaging in salesmanship. Uh, we really do have a lot of new information uh, to share with you. Literally, I was updating this PowerPoint again this morning um, because I am going to touch on some of the changes to the state rules as well. And so we, we have some changes there to report also. Uh, but we're going to start off with the feds. And uh, first of all, um, you know, we've taking it kind of a step back to the beginning of 2021. Uh, we all know from 2020, we had a lot of conflicting information out there. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of guidance, but, you know, it was it was shifting sands, basically. Very difficult for employers to, to build the program upon. Um, and so when we had the administration change, uh, President Biden issued an executive order right out of the gate and directed OSHA to consider doing an emergency temporary standard and to issue, you know, make a decision on it by March 15th, the eyes of March. <laughs> Excuse me. He also uh, directed OSHA <coughs> to issue new guidance uh, by February 5th. Well, they beat that. They got that out by uh, January 29th. Uh, they also were directed to issue a national emphasis program dealing with COVID-19. That came out on March 2nd, uh, along with an additional enforcement memorandum. And I'm gonna go through uh, several of these in more detail, so uh, don't worry, but I did wanna give you the links there. Um, meanwhile, my other favorite four-letter word, MSHA, uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, um, after really doing nothing uh, unique to mining in 2020, they issued some new guidance. Uh, that came out on March 10th, 2021 largely tracking with what was then the OSHA CDC elements. And I say then uh, with an emphasis on that because this was in March and things have changed, uh, but they did include some unique recommendations in there for mining work environments. And I've given you the link for that. Um, and that obviously would also apply to contractors working at mines. And uh, just to be clear, when we talk about MSHA jurisdiction, that's not just your coal mines, it's, it's not just gold mines and silver mines, although certainly it is that. It also includes cement plants, it includes stone quarries, it includes sand and gravel operations, of which we have a lot in the region covered by the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. Um, so don't forget folks, so, you know, if you're doing construction, uh, putting a new roof on a scale house at a, at a quarry, you are under MSHA jurisdiction there, not OSHA. Um, in the meantime, uh, you know, while OSHA was kind of sitting on its hands last year, uh, some of the state programs got uh, into play. Cal OSHA, Michigan OSHA, Oregon OSHA, and of course, near and dear to our hearts, Virginia OSHA, Bosch, uh, all came out with emergency standards for COVID. Now, Virginia was the first state in the country to do an ETS, and then they finalized a permanent rule that took effect in part January 27th this year and in full by the end of uh, March. Well, you know, we're going to cover the updates on all of these states. Cal OSHA, uh, that's the one that just literally 
new new information came out this morning because of a vote they took yesterday, um, which which was only reported today. Um, Oregon OSHA uh, they went permanent as well, and now there's some some action there. Same thing with Michigan. Um, so I'm going to fill you in on all of these. Uh, for those of you who have you know uh, multi-state operations, um, Washington State OSHA WISHA. They just issued a proposed uh, a, a proposed rule intent, uh, but they are broadening it to an infectious disease rulemaking and kind of tuck that away as we talk, because that's going to be the wave of the future, I'm predicting, and, and indeed federal OSHA is going to be going in that direction as well to give you a little sneak preview. Uh, but at this juncture, there's over 14 states um, that have some kind of worker protections that either have been adopted by a state OSHA or through a state executive order, um, in some cases uh, adopting you know, fairly solid uh, work, worker protection rules enforced by the state health department. Now, Amazon is in the process of litigating with New York, claiming that federal OSHA has exclusive jurisdiction over workplace safety and health there. And presumably, you know, any decision in that case would have effect in New Jersey, it would have effect in any of these other federal OSHA states that went beyond what the feds were doing. So uh, that is something to watch if things change again. And I'm not gonna say if, but I'm gonna say when things change again. Um, we're gonna be talking about how a lot of rules have changed in a way, you know, to be blunt, that are weakening uh, worker protections. And the employer community, you know, who admittedly I represent, you know, there's a lot of yelling and screaming and cheering and taking masks and throwing them away or putting them on a bonfire. It is premature, number one. Um, number two, people aren't reading the rules right. They're, they're kind of stopping after they get to the first comma, which is not how it works. Um, and we have to anticipate that this Delta variant from India um, that is now 90% of the cases in the UK. Uh, as of yesterday, it was now 10% of the cases in the US and it spreads much more quickly. Um, it is more virulent um, and it affects younger people. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people still who are unvaccinated and we have not reached uh, herd immunity, which is 70% fully vaxxed. We're not even close to that. Um, there's one or two states that have gotten to that point, but even those figures are a bit misleading because some of the states are saying if people have gotten one of the two shots that they're counting that as immunity. It, it doesn't work that way either. It's two shots plus 14 days if you're using Pfizer or Moderna or one shot for the J&J &J plus 14 days before you can be considered fully vaccinated. And we are, as you're gonna see as we jump into this, I know I'm building this up, um, you're going to have a bifurcated workforce. You know, I don't want to say the haves and the have nots, but kind of the have the vaccine and the not have the vaccine. Uh, definitely different rules going forward. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, it is going to be very confusing for employers um, and it raises the potential for litigation. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at what we have going on here. Um, first of all, um, OSHA sent it back in, in early May, I guess it was, uh, OSHA sent a draft uh, emergency standard uh, over to the Office of uh, Management and Budget, their office called, within that called OIRA, which is the, off the Office for Information and Regulatory Affairs. And they have to approve every uh, proposed rule, every final rule, before it can be published in the Federal Register. Um, so that was at that stage, and they were holding stakeholder meetings, uh, to discuss it both with the labor unions and with the business community. That, the business community kept kicking these out and asking for more and more meetings. All of this was supposed to have been wrapped up, and this timeline is kind of important, by the middle of May, but it didn't. In fact, uh, meetings were even scheduled into June with OIRA. Um, meanwhile, in May, uh, around the third week of May, the CDC kind of lobbed a hand grenade over at OSHA uh, by coming out with this guidance uh, that says, you know, you don't have to wear masks indoors or outdoors if you are vaccinated, but they said unvaccinated people should wear masks indoors. Okay, this was a public health and safety 
document and guidance. It did not govern the workplace, which is under OSHA jurisdiction. Uh, but OSHA has the burden when doing an emergency temporary standard of proving that there is a grave danger to workers that cannot be eliminated through a, a, the course of a normal rulemaking. Um, so definitely it complicated OSHA's con, uh, position uh, if and when they are challenged on the emergency temporary standard that just came out. And, you know, I'm sure the briefs were already written. They're probably hitting the courts now, but, you know, it, it'll take a little a little bit to find out what uh, litigation uh, is going to be brought against OSHA for that. Uh, but the, again, the CDC guidance undermined OSHA's legal ability uh, to make its case that an emergency standard was needed. I think this also contributed uh, ultimately to the narrowing of the scope of the standard. And of course, the draft that went over to OIRA, um, all of that is pre-decisional. So we don't know what changes were made in it and whether they scaled the scope of it back as a result of the meetings with the unions, with the stakeholders uh, on the business side, or whether we had an 11th hour rewrite due to the CDC policy. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, the Biden administration ultimately came out with COVID guidance that is responsive to the CDC policy um, with an update on, ju on June 10th. 2021. So, you know, just just recently, a week ago, uh, seems like a century ago to me at this point. Uh, and I am going to go through that guidance. And that is guidance that applies in the non-healthcare sector. It is for general industry folks. Um, one of the, the, the key things, uh, concepts in here I want you to keep in mind is that uh, the OSHA guidance defines a category of workers they're calling at risk. Um, and those are individuals who may have been vaccinated, uh, but because of their underlying health conditions, they may not have had a full response, uh, you know, immunity-wise to the vaccine. And therefore, they have to be treated carefully, uh, just like somebody who is unvaccinated, really. Um, those individuals who may not have had a full immune response, and, you know, I hate to say it, some of you may be out here and not even have been aware that you fell into this category. Uh, people who've had transplants, heart or heart transplants, liver transplants, kidney transplants. I have several friends in that category. Uh, steroid use. Uh, I'm not talking about the bodybuilders, those guns. Uh, you know, I'm talking about people who might use a steroid inhaler on a regular basis, or they're taking steroids for an autoimmune disorder. And similarly, people who have an autoimmune disorder uh, may, sim may be compromised in their response to the vaccine. So if you fall into any of those uh, buckets, um, you need to be more cautious. You, you maybe do want to continue wearing a mask when you go into stores, you know, leaving aside the whole workplace issue. Um, now, I've, again, I've given you those links uh, to the other guidance that OSHA put out prior to the CDC guidance, just so you have that on one slide. Um, so when they announced uh, the new policy for the non-healthcare sector, which I'm going to talk about next, they also released their emergency standard, um, and it is limited to healthcare settings where suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients are treated. Um, so that itself is limiting language. It's not every healthcare facility. And this is something, you know, that I was just talking to some friends yesterday after this, you know, this kind of came out. Um, they're scrambling to figure out, you know, is the dentist office covered? What about, you know, uh, chiropractic? What about, you know, uh, physical therapy? What about acupuncture? Um, and again, much narrower than you would have thought. Um, it is going to take effect immediately upon publication in the Federal Register. Um, and I haven't seen that yet, but I, I will admit I didn't check the Federal Register index today, uh, which I normally do. Um, but you're going to have only 14 days if you're covered by this, to come into compliance with most of the provisions. And then there are additional provisions dealing with physical barriers, ventilation, and training. You have 30 days from publication in the Federal Register to do that. So, you know, by the end of July, all of this should be in place, uh, I would imagine. Uh, OSHA has already said in guidance, uh, and they haven't put a lot of guidance out on this yet, but, but they said, we will exercise enforcement discretion if you're making a good faith effort to comply. Um, I'm sure many of you are experiencing what other clients of mine are, which is disruptions in the supply chain. 
And so, you know, if you, if all the hospitals all at once order the same type of, you know, partitions or physical barriers, there's going to be a, a, a log jam on that. Uh, there just is. So anticipate that um, if you are covered by this. So what is covered? Well, we know definitively hospitals are covered, nursing homes are covered, and assisted living facilities are covered. Uh, emergency responders, I bet many of you uh, uh, play that role, either directly or maybe as volunteers, you know, for your local fire departments. Uh, home health care workers will be covered by this. Um, that is going to be interesting because so many of them are, you know, what we call gig workers uh, working through staffing agencies, for example. So. Um, that is going to put these staffing agencies in, in a different posture than they had been before. Um, and then employees who work in ambulatory care facilities where suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients are treated. So, you know, what's not in here? Mortuaries aren't in there. The death care industry, the congregate living, the prisons, they aren't covered in here, even though originally they were all considered high risk. Uh, you know, when, when they were being classified uh, by, by OSHA uh, and by the state plans as well. Um, now, this emergency standard exempts fully vaccinated workers from having to mask, from distancing, that's the six foot distancing, and the barrier requirements if they are in well defined areas where there is no reasonable expectation that any person with suspected or confirmed COVID 19 will be present. Uh, in a hospital setting, I'm not really sure where that is. Probably your changing rooms, your break rooms, lunch rooms, maybe office spaces uh, within the hospital, nurses stations, uh, potentially. Uh, but you know, this is going to be, I think, misinterpreted and misapplied by a lot of people. Um, when you are dealing with a potentially fatal disease, which this is, um, I always say, use the strictest interpretation. Um, don't try to look for the loopholes. Don't try to look for the, the escape hatches where you can get away with not following this. Because if they find that you should have been covered by it because you have to report an injury or a death, um, you know, and you're not doing it, you're going to be sanctionable. So, uh, again, be realistic about what your risks of exposure are. Because the, whole, it's, the bottom line is it's about protecting your workers. It's about protecting yourself. Um, so this COVID-19 emergency standard has been codified in subpart uh, U of uh, 29 CFR part uh, 1910. So general industry standard, obviously. Um, 1910-502 uh, talks about uh, the scope of the standard, that it applies to all settings where any employee provides healthcare services or healthcare support services. Okay, time out. Um, that's a lot broader than what I just said. And yet that list of who is covered under it, uh, that's right from OSHA's fact sheet on the rule. Um, so this is where the devil is going to be in the details and you know lawyers are going to be fighting with each other. Um, I consider dental work to be health care. I consider you know physical therapy to be health care. Um, so you know if you are involved in any of those, what about a dialysis lab? You know, that's health care. Uh, it's not listed there necessarily. They do talk about ambulatory, um, but is there an expectation of COVID positive patients getting dialysis? I think there certainly is, given that kidney failure is one of the complications from COVID. Uh, the next is 1910.504. That's a mini respiratory protection program. And that's not me calling it that, that's OSHA calling it that. Um, there's limited situations and requirements about respirators here that go beyond your, your typical uh, respiratory protection standard. Uh, they also added a severability provision to this to say, basically, if one provision of this fails, it isn't gonna kill the whole rule. That was pretty smart of them. Um, and then 1910.509, uh, they've incorporated by reference uh, guidance documents from the CDC, uh, consensus standards for PPE, and the EPA's list of approved disinfectants. Now, EPA, list of products, they incorporate that stuff all the time. Uh, consensus standards, certainly, you know, we, we have those incorporated by reference already. Uh, you know, I, I can think of some examples, you know, uh, Society of Automotive Engineers specifications for seatbelts, you know, just as, a, as, a, as an example. And of course, you've got uh, many other types of PPE that are ANSI approved. Uh, but CDC guidance 
being incorporated by reference into a rule when the CDC has changed uh, its guidance, you know, in a hot New York minute so many times in the last uh, 12 months plus, uh, that is dangerous because once something is incorporated by reference, you cannot just simply follow a new version of it, uh, or at least OSHA cannot enforce any subsequent versions. This is kind of captured in amber at one point in time, and that is going to become the law. So if CDC updates its guidance two weeks from now because they find that you know things have changed uh, and maybe they were premature in saying burn all your masks, uh, they didn't really say burn all your masks, but you know you know what I'm saying. Um, OSHA is going to have to do a, do an amendment to this rule, uh, basically. Uh, so that is a little bit, to me, disturbing that they went that incorporation by reference route rather than just spelling out the provisions that they wanted to have uh, in the rule. Um, it makes it harder to find the law, frankly. Um, so the key requirements of this, um, and I know we don't have a lot of healthcare people probably on here, so I put more detail in here than you need, but you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan in writing if you have uh, more than 10 people. Uh, you have to have a designated safety coordinator. This sounded like the Virginia rule so far, isn't it? Um, uh, who has to, you have to involve your non-managerial employees in hazard assessment. That's a good idea anyway, regardless of what hazard you're looking at. And you have to have policies and procedures developed to minimize the risk of transmission. Okay, the next is patient screening and management, uh, limiting and monitoring points of entry uh, to settings where direct patient care is provided. Um, and that, I think, dovetails with what I was just saying before, which is that the fully vaccinated healthcare professionals, you know, and, and hospital employees can unmask indoors if they're in an area where it, it, it isn't likely that a patient or somebody positive uh, for COVID is going to come in. The next is standard and transmission-based precautions. That is where they've incorporated the CDC guidelines, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, employees have to wear a face mask when indoors and when occupying a vehicle with other people for work purposes. Uh, they have to provide and ensure that employees use respirators and PPE for exposure to people with COVID or suspected COVID. And also, if they're doing aerosol generating procedures, that would be uh, intubation, for example, if you're putting somebody on a ventilator. Um, in addition, uh, aerosol generating procedures, uh, if you're doing that on somebody with a suspected or confirmed COVID case, you have to limit the people who are present only to those essential to the process and perform it in an airborne infection isolation room if you have one available. And then obviously everything has to be cleaned and disinfected uh, after the fact, which I would hope the hospitals were doing anyway. Um, physical distancing, six feet apart, still the rule. Um, physical barriers, uh, installing clean, or disposable solid barriers at each fixed work location in non-patient care areas if employees are not separated by from others by at least six feet. And then the cleaning and disinfecting, and they specify you know, what to use for that, um, how to often to do it. And again, reinforcing what we all know, even the, even the school kiddies know that you have to have at least 60% alcohol for a hand-based uh, alcohol rub uh, to be effective. So those uh, are some of the uh, requirements. Then it goes on, the engineering controls, ventilation, um, the employer owned or the, the systems they control for heat, uh, ventilation and air conditioning have to be used in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and design specs, and they have to use a MERV 13 or greater uh, air filtration. Um, that's a pretty big deal. You know, you probably wanna talk to your HVAC folks about uh, you know whether the ductwork needs cleaning, whether uh, filters need cleaning, uh, you know at this point in time, um, and and you know get the airflow rates adjusted. Uh, mechanical engineers are going to like that portion of the program. Um, health screening and management that hasn't gone away. If you're in the healthcare sector, you still have to be screened before each work shift. Um, you have to require employees to notify the employer if they are positive suspect that they have COVID or they're experiencing symptoms. Um, there are other employees that have to be notified within 24 hours if a person is positive. Um, there's procedures for removing people from the workplace if they are positive. Um, and then if you have more than 10 people, you have to uh, provide medical removal uh, benefits uh, in accordance with standard 
uh, for workers who have to isolate or quarantine. Um, so that's a good thing, you know, for the worker protection. Obviously, if people are not paid while they're in quarantine, they're going to try to, you know, talk you into letting them come back sooner. Vaccination. Um, under this rule, employers have to provide a reasonable amount of time and also paid leave for vaccinations and vaccine side effects. Whoa, I see some litigation coming on this. OSHA has now gotten into the wage and hour uh, department of uh, the Department of Labor. Um, that's That one is going to probably uh, end up in litigation. I'll just leave it at that. Um, training. Um, workers have to receive training so they can comprehend how COVID transmits the tasks and the situations that could result in infection and training on the employer's relevant policies and procedures. And let me reiterate, you know, uh, this will come up again a little bit later. Uh, all training has to be done in a language and a vocabulary that the worker can understand. Uh, and if you're relying on written collateral information, make sure that the person can read. Uh, that is, I, have to, I just had this come up in a case yesterday. Uh, a new case where, you know, after working there for a year, they found out that the person couldn't read. Uh, so be careful about that. Um, and then they've embedded a separate and no retaliation policy in here. Um, so that gives them a separate uh, cause of action. If the worker misses the 30 day deadline under Section 11C of the OSH Act, this would allow them to notify OSHA within 180 days that they had been retaliated against, and there would be a statute, uh, excuse me, a codified provision that OSHA could cite, uh, find the employer, you know, at least theoretically up to $136,532 per affected worker. Um, and then the abatement for that would be re reinstating the worker or restoration of benefits or whatever uh, uh, harm they had suffered as a result of the retaliation. Uh, there's also a record keeping requirement. You have to keep a COVID specific log if you have more than 10 employees of all employee instances of COVID, regardless of whether you believe that it was occupationally contracted or not. Um, and you have to make these records available. Um, and then you have to report work related COVID fatalities and inpatient hospital hospitalizations to OSHA. Um, this has been uh, the report, uh, the reportability, not the recordability, but the reportability has been, uh, you know, a little bit uh, in flux. Originally, if you thought it was work related, you had to report it. Uh, then uh, under the Trump administration, they said, well, we're figuring the triggering event is when the virus goes up your nose and nobody is hospitalized within 24 hours of that happening. So under the OSA severe injury reporting rule, you only have to report an inpatient hospitalization if it occurs within 24 hours of the triggering event. So that was how they they got to the point of telling employers, notify us if somebody dies within 30 days of getting COVID uh, that's work related, but don't notify us about hospitalizations. It appears from this that they are shifting back on that. But again, we're going to have to wait for a bit more clarification. So uh, that is everything uh, that you probably more than you need to know on the healthcare specific emergency standard. Um, and again, you know, that can be modified down the road, uh, but now that they have put it kind of in, in stone and or will be in the federal register, um, it's a bit harder for them to make alterations in it the way they had been with their, their fluctuating policy. Um, I still remember uh, the, the, the 30 something page uh, booklet that OSHA put out in March of 2020 for small employers, how to deal with COVID, and like the takeaway was, don't don't use masks. Um, and boy, did things change after that. Um, so here we are now, um, June tenth, twenty twenty one. The new guidance that has come out, and this is uh, OSHA's guidance informed by the May twenty twenty one CDC revised guidance. So what OSHA says now is, except for workplace settings covered by the emergency standard, which we just talked about or mask requirements that are, are you know, mandated for public transportation, most employers no longer need to take steps to protect workers from COVID-19 exposure in any workplace, comma. And that is where too many of the employers are stopping and going, yeah, yeah we don't have to do anything anymore. That is not the rule. After the comma, it says where all employees are fully vaccinated, all, you know, 
not all but your 23 year old receptionist not all but you know the uh elderly person you know that that uh works there and said they don't want to get it uh no all and if you do not have a hundred percent fully vaccinated and that means two shots plus 14 days or one shot of the j and j plus 14 days then you have to treat it as a hybrid workplace where you have both vaccinated and unvaccinated. So what do you do then? Well, if you have unvaccinated or at-risk workers in the workplace, um, OSHA says you've got 11 different things that they recommend. Now, these are not enforceable per se. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb, though, and say that if you end up having to notify OSHA about a COVID cluster, or you have employees who call them with a hazard complaint and they come in, maybe you're inspected under the National Emphasis Program we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, this is out there, this is, this is you know, imputed to you really, that, that this is the guidance. And if they come in and they find that, you know, you've implemented three out of those, these 11 recommendations and then you've had a COVID cluster, I think that you are teed up for a citation under OSHA's general duty clause which is section 5A1 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. So what are the 11 steps? Um, first of all, they recommend uh, giving paid time off for employees to get vaccinated. Remember in the ETS, it's mandated, but for non-healthcare workers, it's recommended. Um, instructing workers who've had close contact with infected people, or if they are themselves infected, to stay home. I think that should be a mandate rather than a recommendation. But again, uh, this is a recommendation at this point. Uh, implementing physical distancing for unvaccinated or at-risk workers in all communal work areas. So what is that? That is break rooms, that's locker rooms, bathrooms, office space. You know, if you have a cubicle farm, uh, that would fall into, into that category. An open space manufacturing facility, uh, you know, that's indoors. And that's really what they're, they're talking about here is indoors. Uh, protecting unvaccinated or at-risk workers with face coverings or surgical masks unless their work already requires them to wear a respirator or, or other face covering PPE, like a welding shield, perhaps. Um, this is the part, this number four here, that everybody seems to have missed, is that workers still have to wear face coverings indoors at work if they are not vaccinated, you know, or if they have been vaccinated, but they fall into that at-risk category. Um, you also still recommended to train workers on your policies, again, in both accessible formats and in a language that they understand. Uh, they recommend suggesting that your unvaccinated uh, third party visitors wear face coverings uh, because you don't know what their status is and you really aren't going to be in a position to ask them. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, maintaining your ventilation systems. And um, if you read a little deeper into the OSHA guidance, uh, they do specifically talk about the ASHRAE uh, uh, specifications uh, for maintaining HVAC systems. And again, that 13 MERV uh, uh, comes up there. Um, the routine cleaning and disinfecting. And again, uh, just as they've been saying from the beginning, from, from last spring, uh, there are specific cleaning chemicals that the EPA has listed on that uh, uh, list N, like in Nancy. And those are the ones you want to use. Um, there's still the recording and reporting requirements. And again, I've talked about the reporting already, but remember, even if you don't have to notify OSHA about an inpatient hospitalization because it occurred more than 24 hours after the exposure, you still, if it's work-related, have to put that on your log. So don't confuse the reporting, which is calling OSHA within eight hours of a fatality or 24 hours of hospitalization, amputation, or eye loss. Don't confuse that with what you have to put on your OSHA 300 and 301 laws. Um, they also recommend implementing procedures uh, so that people can anonymously report concerns that they have about COVID. Uh, that's a good way, frankly, for employers to insulate themselves from charges that they targeted somebody for termination because they complained about COVID. If they don't know who filed the, the form in the suggestion box or the, the uh, anonymous complaint system, uh, they can't retaliate against that person. Um, and don't try to connect the dots and, and play, uh, you know, detective gadget here. You don't want to know who the whistleblower is. If you guess, if you speculate, 
especially if there's a paper trail of that as I had in one case, and then you take action against that person, that is actionable, that is protected under Section 11C, um, regardless of whether they were the complainant or not. You know, if you're if you're perceived to be a whistleblower, you're protected even if you if you never dropped a dime. And if you dropped a dime, but you weren't, you know, regarded to be the whistleblower, you're still protected too. So be careful about that. Um, and then OSHA re does remind you in this that uh, there are other standards they still have the right to cite. Um, you know, respiratory protection. Um, you know, PPE assessment, that, that is a big one. You do have to consider exposure to COVID-19, you know, when you're doing your PPE written uh, uh, assessment, that's under 1910.132. The respiratory protection under 1910.134. Um, sanitation, having potable water, having, uh, you know, hand washing stations, or if you're, you know, in construction and you don't have that ability, uh, you know, at least having uh, the hand sanitizer that's at least 60% alcohol available. And then there are also uh, medical records requirements under uh, all of that. So they can still cite you under uh, those existing standards, even though they opted not to do a COVID specific uh, emergency standard for general industry and construction. Uh, just be aware of all of that. Uh, now, uh, they also, as I mentioned, back in March, issued a revised enforcement memorandum. Um, and the key points on this, this was actually kind of uh, inward facing to, to advise OSHA's inspectors on what they were supposed to do, rather than it being a public facing aimed at the employer community. Um, but they reinforced that OSHA is going to continue doing on-site inspections. They're going to identify COVID exposures. They're going to ensure appropriate controls are implemented. And they're going to use that toolbox of existing standards plus the general duty clause uh, for enforcement. Um, they they told the inspectors that they could uh, continue uh, using phone and video uh, conferencing rather than doing face-to-face -face interviews uh, to mitigate the exposure that the inspectors themselves have. Uh, they're asking for documents electronically rather than you know asking you know, for the workers to physically hand them something. It's just a way to, to eliminate the, the cross-contamination. Um, and of course, if the inspectors think that they've been exposed to COVID, they have to report that to their area director. Uh, they are continuing to do unprogrammed COVID-19 inspections as a priority. Those are the ones that result either from a hazard complaint by an, a current employee or uh, a discrimination retaliation complaint that's COVID related. Um, and then, they will do the programmed national emphasis program COVID inspections. Uh, normally the programmed inspections are the lower priority um, and they will still be here vis-a-vis -vis the hazard and, and the discrimination complaints. Uh, but they, you know, in other regards, they will be taking priority over some of the other uh, emphasis programs. And then um, OSHA is also going to, you know, try to use its resources smart in a smart way by considering things like the extent of community transmission, the type of work activity at the work site, you know, if, if it's a high, higher risk area, uh, they're more likely to come and visit you. Um, is it the type of activity where workers can wear face coverings? Um, and then they'll examine uh, how closely are you following the OSHA standards and the CDC guidance. Um, they're also going to be still looking at the whole close contact uh, uh, issue and that was defined by the CDC as being within six feet of other people for a total of 15 minutes within a 24 hour period. So it's not 15 minutes with Larry, 15 minutes with Mo, and 15 minutes with Curly. It's aggregated 15 minutes total with all three stooges. Um, and if if you meet that criteria, then you have to consider yourself as being in close contact uh, for purposes of whether barriers and and other controls are needed. Um, and then OSHA was also uh, told uh, that the inspectors can consider mitigation by the employer, including vaccines. So uh, again, definitely still pushing uh, toward trying to get all workers fully vaccinated where possible. Uh, so um, what about the national emphasis programs? Um, that took effect uh, immediately on uh, March 12, 2021. It was intended to be a one-year program but it can be canceled, it can be amended, it could be extended. Uh, again, clearly this came out before the CDC's amended guidance 
um, and OSHA uh, has not yet put out an amendment to this NEP, but that may be in the works. So uh, uh, I will say we still don't have a confirmed head of OSHA, uh, but Doug Parker, who uh, had been the head of Cal OSHA, uh, was just cleared for confirmation by the Senate, uh, by the Senate uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee earlier this week. So we could have a confirmed head of OSHA, you know, uh, before the 4th of July, um, and then at that point, he may want to put his own stamp on things. Uh, everybody's saying, you know, uh, that OSHA may look more like Cal OSHA going forward. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, although I fight with them a lot in litigation. Uh, but they do have some things that are more protective than federal OSHA, like safety and health management programs, for example. Um, so stay tuned on that. Uh, when they enacted this national emphasis program, uh, the goal was to uh, focus on targeted industries, work sites where there's a high frequency of these close contact, again, within six feet for more than 15 minutes a day. Um, one of the things that is unique about this emphasis program is that it has a built-in whistleblower protection component. Uh, the COSHOs, that's Compliance Safety and Health Officers, and we call them inspectors, and some of you call them something else, uh, they're going to be giving out educational information to your workers. Uh, they're going to be explaining what their rights are under both Section 11C and also under Part 1904, which uh, in 2016, they modified that uh, as part of the electronic record keeping rule uh, to also beef up whistleblower protections. And they uh, incorporated by reference Section 11C into Part 1904.36, which just as I was explaining before, gives OSHA the ability to issue a citation for worker discrimination um, and then cite the employer and require them to reinstate or otherwise make that, that worker whole as the abatement measure. Um, a lot of people thought that that was limited to reporting of injuries and illnesses, but it is not. Um, now that national emphasis program has a, a number of components, inspection targeting, as well as outreach to both workers, obviously, and uh, the employers and compliance assistance. But here's a kicker. Um, OSHA, uh, under the Trump administration in 2018, relaunched what had been a, a, a defunct site-specific targeting program, uh, benchmarking it to the electronically submitted data. Um, and that's all on OSHA's website now, by the way. It's fully searchable for uh, calendar years 2016 through 2020 by employer name. So um, if you didn't know that your data is hanging out there naked for the world to see, it is. Um, and uh, anyway, OSHA is mining that data, looking at uh, the, the National uh, North American Industrial Classification System code sectors that are at higher risk, and then looking at the workplaces that uh, their own records showed had elevated DART rates that stays away from work restricted duty and transfers. Um, the Trump administration also changed that just in December to say they had to have an upward trend for three years uh, otherwise, the inspector could exercise discretion and choose not to inspect them. Well, how does this relate to COVID? It relates to COVID because let's say you're number 20 on your area uh, list for the site-specific targeting visit. They're probably not going to get to you, but you come up uh, under the uh, COVID national emphasis program. <clears throat> if they come and do the inspection under the COVID NEP, they're going to go ahead and do the full-blown site-specific targeting program too, just because you were on the list. You're going to get promoted to number one on, on the, the list. And that means that they will not just look at COVID-related hazards. They will do a wall-to-wall -wall inspection. Soup to nuts, they'll look at your fire safety. They'll look at your exits. They'll look at your garden. They'll look at you know how you have pallets stacked in the backyard. Uh, everything is going to be on the table um, and a record review. Um, so. You know, it, it sucks to be you if you get picked for the COVID uh, inspection and you also uh, are in one of those high hazard industries because, you know, you're going to get probably torn up a little bit uh, if you don't have your house in order. And I, I want to say that uh, sincerely because I have plenty of clients that get through OSHA inspections with no citations. It's, it's not a given that you're going to get, get cited. They don't have a bounty on you. Uh, but if you have kind of let things grow lax, over the past year, um, you know, again, yeah, you could get torn up. Uh, so be careful about that. 
Um, also, if you were inspected by OSHA last year uh, for COVID uh, and they told you to do some stuff, they're going to possibly come back to you uh, this year to see if you've maintained those, mo those efforts. Um, if you haven't, you could be facing a willful violation. So again, uh, the worst thing is uh, to have started doing protections and then just stop abruptly for whatever reason because you think the heat is off. Uh, because then that does show knowledge of the hazard, it shows knowledge of the feasible uh, control method, and it shows a willful intent uh, to stop protecting your workers. So just, again, be mindful. I have several clients that were inspected uh, last year under COVID, and you know I've already told them they have to be very, very careful. Um, also remember, OSHA got an additional $100 million uh, to use just for the remainder of, uh, of fiscal year 2021 which ends at the end of September. Um, and only 5 million of that was earmarked for COVID, uh, 10 million for the Susan Harwood Grants Program, uh, but that leaves 85 million additional dollars for them to use for enforcement. Um, and then the proposed budget for 2022, which of course would start October 1st of this year, um, OSHA would be getting roughly a 17% increase. Um, and there's also uh, some of that directly allocated for hiring uh, hundreds of additional inspectors. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have the money to carry out uh, the things that I'm talking about here. Um, just real quickly here on this emphasis program, um, you know, this is kind of the triage on how they're going to approach it. Um, I recommend that you look at the, uh, uh, the codes and you read the documentation on this NEP to determine whether or not uh, you're likely to be inspected under it. Um, but they're really gonna be focusing on verifying that you're doing the proper things to protect your workers. Um, so a lot to that, um, more certain, I mean, I, we could probably do 90 minutes just on the National Emphasis Program, uh, but I think this gives you a flavor for what's going on with that. Um, so now let's shift gears a bit. Um, and, and remember, I will be taking your questions uh, at the end of the webinar. So. Uh, uh, get them into uh, the chat or the Q&A uh, so that we can deal with them. Um, so state programs um, and MSHA, um, as I mentioned, MSHA put out guidance uh, back in March. Uh, the unique recommendations there mostly have to do with ventilation and underground mines. Uh, their surface mines are very similar to construction sites really. Um, so the hazards there are not terribly unique. Um, but let's focus first on, on the state plan uh, programs. Uh, as I mentioned, Virginia finalized their rule and it's already taken effect. And I'm going to go through each of these separately here coming up. Uh, Cal OSHA had adopted before COVID ever came out, they had an aerosol transmissible disease or ATD standard in place. That was adopted after the uh, Ebola scare, frankly. Um, but then they adopted an emergency standard um, that, that, uh, you know, was out there and then they started modifying it. And that was literally the stuff I updated this morning and I'm gonna to get to those slides here in a few minutes. Uh, Oregon OSHA adopted its permanent rule. My OSHA, uh, WISHA, we talked about all of that. Nevada OSHA also just issued a new COVID policy last month. Um, so there's a lot going on in terms of the number of states that have these protections as, as we mentioned. Uh, with MSHA, I know <laughs> I may be the only person here who cares about MSHA, uh, but uh, on the off chance that you do, uh, this is what they are recommending, and this is guidance. But I want to say MSHA has no tools to enforce this. Uh, they don't have a general duty clause. They don't have a codified respiratory protection standard. Uh, what they have, they've incorporated by reference the 1987 version of the ANSI Z88.1 consensus standard. Not uh, terribly protective. Um, you know, but they do recommend that you, you know, have a coordinator to oversee COVID issues, uh, report uh, COVID infections and deaths. And I will say, MSHA's recording and, and reporting is different. Um, with MSHA, you don't keep logs. Instead, you have 10 uh, working days to file a 7000-1 form online through the MSHA portal. Uh, if you have any injury or illness that results in medical uh, treatment, uh, you know, beyond first aid, hospitalization, you know, days away from work restricted duty, transfer, death. Uh, but 
Amsha says if it may, if an illness may have uh, you know resulted from, from the mine, then you have to report it. So OSHA kind of leaves it to the employer to determine if it's more likely than not, and you know which is more of a, a balance there. Is it 51% or more likely? That's on the OSHA side. With MSHA, if there's a skinny chance that they got it at the mine, you're supposed to notify MSHA. And MSHA is also going around to mine operators because, again, they inspect twice a year whether you need it or not. And they're asking them for uh, information on their COVID cases just for data, even though they can't enforce on it. Uh, but they can enforce training. And if you're not training on COVID, uh, you could get cited by MSHA for that. Um, beyond that, uh, there's not a whole lot that they can do uh, absent an emergency temporary standard. And I will note that there is bipartisan legislation in Congress right now. Uh, Republicans, yeah, Republicans have sponsored it to force OSHA to do an emergency, oh, excuse me, to force MSHA to do an emergency temporary standard. They have had outbreaks in mines. Um, and there's also studies suggesting that miners uh, may be at a heightened risk for COVID and also for long COVID, for complications, because of pre-existing lung damage due to coal dust, silica exposure, uh, other mine dusts and gases. Um, so it is a bit different from your construction and your general industry workplaces in that regard. Uh, but that's basically all you need to know about MSHA. Uh, other than, uh, just to recap what I've been talking about already, whistleblower protections, uh, both OSHA and MSHA will hold your feet to the fire if you are retaliating against people who refuse to work because of COVID fears, if you, uh, you know, if they report a COVID case, if they report to the agency that uh, you haven't been following COVID precautions. And I am handling more whistleblower cases personally right now, both OSHA and MSHA cases, uh, than I did in the entire four years of the Trump administration. Um, and these have all been brought since January 21st. And many of these hazard inspections do start off with an employee complaining about COVID uh, precautions. So uh, be careful about that because uh, with OSHA, as I said, they can fine you if they go through the 1904.36. And with MSHA, uh, they can fine the company up to $75,000 for a whistleblower violation. Um, and then they can fine all supervisors, uh, including the evil HR lady or the safety director if you participated in the decision to retaliate against a worker uh, you know, who reported a hazard or engaged in a work refusal, personal fines up to 75 grand, seriously. Um, so that's what's going on, again, kind of completing the federales there. Now let's look uh, state by state at what's going on. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about vaccine policy at the very end, and then we'll take, to your, take your questions. So that's the uh, roadmap for the rest of the time we have here together. So Virginia, they uh, were the first uh, COVID standard in the country. Uh, the permanent rule took effect fully as of March 26, 2021. It applies to all employers in the state of Virginia. And if you are a contractor doing work in Virginia, that's gonna to apply to you when you're there as well, as well. This has been one of the challenges, frankly, uh, in our, you know, DMV area, as we call it, because let's say you're a contractor based in Maryland or DC, but you send crews into Virginia, you have to have programs consistent with the Virginia requirements for those crews. And that also leads to disparate protections. Um, I don't know, frankly, how you justify protecting your workers who, who go into Virginia at one level and then having lesser levels of protections for your similarly situated crews who are working on projects in, you know, Maryland or DC or Pennsylvania or West Virginia. Uh, and, and I'm gonna carve Maryland out there for a second, but certainly any that are working in the federal jurisdictions. Um, now, when they made the changes uh, in, in the Virginia rule uh, from the emergency standard to the permanent one, uh, they modified some of it, but they kept the focus on applying specific provisions based upon the risk level, um, which requires you as an employer to do you know, kind of a risk assessment and triage to determine which tasks fall into the different categories. And we'll, um, I'm gonna review those with you. Um, Virginia OSHA said, you can comply with CDC guidelines, the mandatory and non-mandatory, and here's a hint, there are no mandatory guidelines because they're guidelines. 
if they want to be non mandatory if they want to be mandatory, they have to publish them in the Federal Register and go through notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, I actually did my law my law school thesis on shadow rulemaking by uh, Ocean and MSHA about 120 years ago, um, and it's still an issue. Um, but uh, as a practical matter, um, you can only follow this guidance if it's equivalent or greater protection than the provision uh, that matches it in the VOSH rule. And right now, none of the CDC guidance is as protective as the permanent VOSH rule. That is a complication. You also have to consider that, you know, if the VOSH rule says uh, you must, you shall, you will, that's mandatory. And if the guidance says you should, you may, you might want to consider, perhaps it's a good idea, that is not mandatory. So it's not comparable protection. That's why, you know, this is, is really problematic in terms of the latest CDC guidance. Um, in the permanent standard, uh, they continued the classification of workplaces into one of four categories, very high, high, medium, or lower. But they recognize that one workplace may have a mix of these exposures within their workforce. And that is something you're going to have to consider as part of your risk assessment. Um, you have to consider airborne transmission. Ventilate, uh, uh, respira respirable particles are really where it's at in terms of COVID transmission. Um, you do still want to uh, be cleaning and decontaminating your surfaces, your tools, your objects. You know, if, if people are sharing a workstation in different shifts, you want to wipe down the keyboard and the telephone receiver and the mouse, you know, before somebody else uh, jumps right into that chair, uh, you know, to take over. Um, workstations, uh, break rooms, locker rooms, entrances and exits. Um, now, I know some people are saying, oh, it's all hygiene theater and we don't need to do that anymore. Um, in fact, my HOA here, you know, just uh, abolished the cleaning requirements, you know, at our pool. Um, okay, it's outdoors, but um, I, again, I think people are rushing to relax everything a bit uh, too quickly. I'll, I'm just, you know, as, as my as uh, you know, a few people's mothers have said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think we are in that posture right now. Um, you know, I have lost over the past year over a dozen friends and relatives to COVID. So I take this serious as can be. Um, I don't want to get it. I don't want to die from it. And you know, so you're gonna. I'm fully vaccinated. You're gonna still see me putting a mask on when I go into stores at this point. Um, you know, but when it comes to the workplace, you, the, the employer, has ultimately the responsibility and the liability, at least to make sure that people are safe on their watch. You can't control what happens off duty, but you can control what, what you're doing in the workplace. So, um, you know, consider all of these things, the shared vehicles, uh, we've talked about that already. And then don't forget that your assessment of COVID hazards and your decision on whether to provide personal protective equipment needs to be documented on your written PPE hazard assessment. And I will tell you, OSHA's field operations manual, which is their instruction, their, their Bible for inspectors on how to conduct inspections, that is one of the things they put on there to ask for in general industry inspections. Now, construction, you're supposed to do the hazard assessment, but they don't require you to document it. Documentation to me is always a good idea um you know whether it's training or anything else because if it isn't documented it's up to osha whether to believe you that it occurred or not um so document 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 in my book um now as far as all virginia employers and again this was the rule adopted as of and that took effect as of the end of uh, march this year you have to do that assessment you have to classify each job task according to the hazards and ensure compliance with the applicable category uh, for that task. Uh, policies for your workers to report if they're experiencing symptoms or signs of COVID. Uh, don't let them to keep working until they are screened and cleared for work. And there were a lot of return to work uh, minutia in this rule. Uh, it's, it's you know, right up there with uh, figuring out the square root of the hypotenuse. Um, take a look at it if you're covered by this because it's very, very detailed. Um, make sure you're coordinating with your subcontractors companies that give you staffing agency, uh, you know, temporary employees, uh, about the need to communicate and keep those temp workers or contractors home. Don't bring them to your workplace. Um, 
and, and encourage them to have non-punitive sick leave policies. Because again, uh, if people are experiencing economic hardship, which many are, and they know they're gonna lose, you know, 10 days of work to be quarantined, uh, they're gonna conceal their illness as long as they can uh, in some situations. So uh, watch out for that. Um, also, you have the notification requirement to other employers in a shared work site or building, as well as the building or facility owner, if you have a COVID test on your employee. Um, and then there's also requirements to notify the uh, Virginia Department of Health and also uh, their, their labor department, which is OSHA, um, in certain circumstances about uh, cases and about uh, clusters of cases, uh, outbreaks, um, as well as following the protocols for employees returning to work. So that was all what was in that Virginia rule. Um, you know, the classifications are very high. Very high is what we were talking about earlier, where there's going to be uh, a lot of respirable particles, uh, perhaps intubating somebody. Um, the post-mortem and laboratory as well, very high risk. High risk um, are your, your general healthcare and first responders. Um, and then the medium category, that's the sweet spot. That's where most manufacturers, construction is going to fall in there. Any kind of non-office work that isn't health care or death care or congregate services. Um, and then finally, there's the lower category uh, where you're not having to come within six feet of people for more than 15 minutes a day. Um, and, uh, you know, you have minimal contact also uh, either through engineering, administrative or work practice controls. Uh, so most offices will fall into that lower category, but your cubicle firms might not. So that is, again, under Virginia OSHA. Uh, training requirements, you have to train all workers on the rule, on your control programs, on uh, their rights, uh, the symptoms of COVID, all of that good stuff in a language and a vocabulary that they understand. And Virginia notes, bearing in mind that there could be a literacy issues if you are relying on written materials. Um, beyond that, the Virginia rule says no enforcement action will be brought against an employer for failure to provide PPE if it is not commercially uh, readily available and you've made a good faith effort to procure it. Um, this kind of goes back to their, it carried over from their emergency rule, which was promulgated last summer, back when we still had significant uh, problems getting hold of uh, N95 uh, uh, respirators. Um, now, many people had thought that this Virginia rule would serve as the template for a federal OSHA standard. Um, and in fact, when you know when you compare this to what I went through, I know it feels like hours ago, but it was only an hour ago, uh, with the ETS for healthcare that federal OSHA just came out with, there's a lot of things that parallel this Virginia rule. Um, I've given you the links to the rule, the final rule, and also the guidance. Uh, uh, the guidance alone, I think, is about 50 pages long. There's a lot to it. Um, the business community was not happy about this rule. Um, I'm not representing anybody in litigating against Moshe on this, so I don't have a dog in that hunt. Um, but, you know, expect that Virginia OSHA is going to be making some changes on this. And I wanted you to see in full uh, what what is the law right now in Virginia because obviously Virginia is part of our region here. Uh, but now I'm gonna go through uh, a bit quicker than I did that, these other state laws, and you can see how they are starting to retrench a bit and reframe the issues. So uh, before I get to those codified though, uh, there was another little stealth development that um, got by a lot of people. And that is that the Maryland legislature uh, just uh, enacted legislation requiring uh, uh, COVID rules by Maryland OSHA. Um, the uh, bill was HR 581, if anybody wants to read it. Um, and it became law just in the beginning of June without Governor Hogan's signature. He just, uh, he, he knew that they could override a veto, so he didn't veto it, but he just stood down without putting his imprimatur on it, probably because uh, I think he has some political aspirations and that could definitely uh, put the kibosh on those. Uh, but uh, leaving his motivation aside, uh, the law that just uh, came into effect this month requires Maryland OSHA or MOSH to implement an emergency standard similar to the VOSH rule um, and to adopt any new federal OSHA standard uh, for COVID. So that means that that federal emergency standard 
uh, for health care should be enforceable by most, uh, you know, because of this legislation. Um, keep an eye on that one, folks, especially if you work in the healthcare sector in Maryland. Um, the, it also says that essential workers are permitted to refuse to perform certain tasks. So that work refusal is embedded there, just like it is in the Bosch rule. Um, it requires essential employers. Most of that is healthcare, but remember, uh, construction ended up getting classified as essential. Retail, uh, you know, a lot of that ended up, uh, you know, pharmacies, for example, uh, drugstores ended up being considered essential. Uh, marijuana dispensaries were considered essential businesses in Maryland during the uh, the pandemic uh, when they had most other businesses closed. And so any, if you were classified back then as an essential employer, you're going to have to take steps to minimize uh, transmission. Um, it also re, uh, prohibits employers from discharging or discriminating against essential workers who file a complaint or exercise other rights under the law. Now, that is already embedded, of course, in the Mosh Act. Uh, because that has to be equally uh, uh, strong as the federal OSHA uh, protections. But this is just a statutory protection now as well, on top of it, that is COVID specific. Um, it mandates that uh, employers cover COVID testing uh, costs. Um, right now it is free, uh, but you know that may not always be the case. And they have a requirement to report some of their positive health results to the Maryland Department of Health which in turn is going to have to categorize and publish the results. And then finally, there's a requirement in this law to grant emergency paid bereavement leave and public health emergency leave to essential workers during the public health emergency on top of any other existing paid leave that they would otherwise be entitled to receive. So a lot to digest there. And you know, I, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I'm chair of the safety committee for the Maryland Transportation and Building Materials Association. And I kept saying, there's, there's a Maryland law that passed and, and, you know, people were having trouble, uh, even their lobbyists trying to find out what was going on with this. Uh, but it did take effect. So, um, there you have it. That's what's going on in Maryland. So now let's move, uh, or uh, the western, westerly direction across the country. Uh, Michigan. Uh, Michigan adopted a COVID emergency standard um, back uh, in October, and it was supposed to have been a six month rule that was subject to either expiration or extension. Well, um, they made uh, amendments to that in response to uh, the, the CDC guidance uh, as of May 24th, 2021. And they've removed the requirement that employers have to have a policy prohibiting in person work uh, if the work activities can be done remotely. So, up until May 24th in Michigan, if somebody could work remotely, you couldn't force them back to work, but now you can. Um, also, MIOSHA, which is their uh, state plan agency, rescinded the uh, draft permanent rules that they have been working on and they modified uh, the emergency standard. So, that remains in effect in a modified format. Uh, fully vaccinated employees do not have to wear face coverings um, or, or social distance um, as long as the employer has a policy that is deemed effective to ensure that non-vaccinated individuals continue to social distance and wear face coverings. So again, we're not out of the woods yet if you have uh, a split workforce where you have the haves and you have the have-nots. Um, the rules also uh, focus now on performance. They've eliminated uh, the industry specific requirements and Michigan's rule was very uh, prescriptive in that they did have different things for manufacturing, different things for construction, different things for healthcare, et cetera. Um, uh, they've changed their definitions uh, to uh, modify what is close contact and, and quarantining requirements for fully vaccinated employees. Uh, cleaning requirements have been changed again to uh, uh, align with the CDC, um, but you still, um, again, if you're an employer who has sites in Michigan, you still have to have a written COVID preparedness and response plan, and it has to be modified to reflect these new rules. Um, so this may be the direction that Virginia OSHA will be going uh, before too long. Uh, now, what about Cal OSHA? Um, as I mentioned up front, they had uh, adopted an aerosol transmissible disease rule I want to say around 2015, 2016, in response to the Ebola outbreak. 
So that remains on the books, but it is limited to hospitals, healthcare facilities, um, correctional facilities are, are included in their hospice care, uh, but they've always had the power to expand it to cover other workplaces if the uh, governor, or, or I, I wouldn't say the governor, Cal OSHA, uh, informs employers that they're gonna be covered by it. So with a dash of the pen, they could cover the construction or the manufacturing sector or the mining sector, frankly, because Cal OSHA has jurisdiction over mines there too. Um, and so when they did their emergency standard, um, which came out last year, very prescriptive, a lot of stuff in it, similar in a lot of ways though to Virginia, um, the one kicker was um, if it was possible for uh, COVID to have been contracted in the workplace, then you had to consider that a work-related case and, and do a report and a record for OSHA. So that was a distinction under the Cal OSHA ETS, but it covered all workplaces. And then they were looking at doing a permanent rule. Um, and then CDC happened. And then... <laughs> This last week of hell happened. Uh, June 9th, Cal OSHA's Standards Board, which is who promulgates their rules, they held a special meeting to hear from their Department of Public Health on the new face covering guidance of the CDC. At that point, they withdrew revisions to the emergency standards that had been in the works to update the uh, COVID rules. Um, then they posted new revisions. It was a 30 page document with a lot of strikeouts um, on June 11th. That incorporated the latest Cal California and federal public health guidance. Then they considered those revisions yesterday at their meeting and they rejected them five to one. Um, so then Governor Newsom issued an executive order making those changes effective immediately as of today. Uh, this is the slide I was working on this morning. Um, so where do things stand now? If you are a California employer who is not covered by the healthcare sector aerosol transmissible disease rule, well, workplaces have to provide masks to workers who are not fully vaccinated and make sure they're wearing face coverings indoors or in shared work vehicles or in employer provided transportation. Um, so that's the first thing. Masks are still a thing in California enforceable by Cal OSHA for unvaccinated workers. Second, you have to provide a respirator, an actual N95, if the worker is not fully vaccinated and requests one. Now, if you're giving them a respirator, an N95, what does that mean? To me, that means you're doing medical evaluations, you're doing fit testing, and no more than one day of growth on your face, because otherwise it's not gonna be an effective uh, seal. Uh, they did eliminate, uh, the need for solid cleanable partitions. That was kind of a shocker. Uh, they also said that unvaccinated workers can only take their mask off indoors if they are alone, maybe in an office with a closed door or working in a piece of, of heavy equipment with an environmentally sealed cab. That would be another example. Or if they're eating or drinking in, a, in say a lunchroom. Uh, beyond that, uh, the employers in California now have to document the vaccination status of employees who are gonna go without face coverings indoors, but they don't have to keep copies of the cards and they have to allow employees to self attest to their inoculation status. Um, I remember you know, when the, the mandates on vaccine uh, first became an issue, there were a lot of people who said, I identify as vaccinated, you know, the, the uh, anti-vaccine uh, contingent. Uh, now people who have bona fide religious uh, objections to vaccination, the employer has to honor those under Title VII and provide reasonable accommodation, um, inc but including making them wear a face mask. Um, and similarly, if you have a disability that prevents you from safely getting the vaccine, um, you can't require somebody to be vaccinated, but um, you do have to still protect them as an unvaccinated person or an at-risk person. Remember, we talked about the definition of that. Um, so this... Uh, has the potential for mischief, uh, shall we say. Um, there is a, a uh, Cal OSHA frequently asked questions page. I've given you the link there. I don't think that they've updated yet to reflect last night's vote, um, but keep an eye on that link if you have uh, workers in California, because things are blowing in the wind and changing very quickly there. And as we've seen with Governor Newsom doing an ex executive order, 
um, he can make any new changes effective right away without any kind of prior notice. Um, and then Oregon OSHA, they adopted an emergency standard uh, in November, um, and then a permanent rule was adopted uh, that took effect May 4th, 2021, for all workplaces. And they did make some changes in that. They held a lot of stakeholder meetings. I even testified uh, at one of their virtual stakeholder meetings on this. Uh, but now they're gonna start meeting on a, on a bi-monthly basis starting next month. Uh, this is their rulemaking advisory committees uh, to determine if any parts of the rule can be repealed. Um, they also issued a press release on June 7th saying that once Oregon reaches 70% fully vaccinated, remember that's two shots in the arm in 14 days, then the state will not require masks or face coverings except in transit or health care. And at that point, Oregon OSHA will repeal its requirement. But in the meantime, you have to have uh, face masks uh, for the most part if you, you know, if you are not vaccinated and if you're gonna be indoors working in close contact. Um, they did go back and they scrubbed all the appendices from their emergency temporary standard to eliminate any guidance that was not specific to worker protection. Um, and uh, the proposed rule also um, had some information on informing people about their leave rights and on vaccines. That was stricken from the final rule. So uh, Oregon and employers no longer have to do that. Um, and uh, the basic provisions, uh, you do still have to have six foot distancing there, face coverings uh, weren't, uh, indoors uh, provided at no cost by the employer, wear them in vehicles uh, for work purposes, uh, unless it's all members of the same household. And sometimes you might have, you know, a couple of brothers and a cousin who all live together and work together, you know, in, in that case, or a husband and wife and their, their adult child. So in those cases, you wouldn't have to wear face coverings, but as soon as a third party is in the vehicle, you would. Uh, also, they put an emphasis on maintaining the existing ventilation systems. Uh, and I wanna stress this because I didn't before, none of these rules that talk about cleaning and maintaining your ventilation systems require the employer to install a new system. You just have to maintain what you've got to the best ex extent that you can. Um, and then in Oregon, if you have more than 10 employees, you have to attest that you are running the ventilation system in accordance with the rule. Now, making a false attestation to OSHA that can get you, uh, you know, prison time. So don't do it. You know, just fix your ventilation system and then attest to it. But uh, don't don't sign a false attestation. Um, and then you have to post uh, their COVID posters uh, both in English and Spanish uh, if you have a bilingual workforce. And the state of, of Oregon makes those available. Um, so that's what's going on. Uh, the final rule, uh, pretty much the same things we've been talking about. Um, you know, uh, also give an opportunity for employee feedback. That's something new here. You have to have a social distancing officer, um, but this, if you have a safety committee, then that can be uh, the mechanism for providing feedback. Um, and you have to explain your pro programs and policies in a language and vocabulary the workers understand. That's a, a common refrain here. You also in Oregon have to notify workers within 24 hours of any work-related COVID infections uh, and then cooperate with public health officials if they want to make sure, if they want to have you test everybody in your workplace. Um, there are additional measures for high-risk jobs, uh, uh, mostly those uh, paralleling what we've been talking about for the healthcare sector. Um, and then Washington State, you know, they didn't want to be left out. We were going all up, up the coast there, you know, uh, so they're the third on a match, but they're a little late to the dance. Uh, May 13th, they filed a notice of possible rulemaking uh, for occupational exposures to infectious or contagious diseases. So notably, this is not COVID specific. Um, and this would allow them to respond to future pandemics. Um, you know, <laughs> we just heard that there's a, a chicken flu, uh, avian flu in China that has passed over into a human. Okay, that was always the world pandemic disaster scenario that I saw, you know, when I attended some training uh, uh, classes on this at safety conferences. Uh, so this would, would position them to respond to that very, very quickly. Things like Zika could come into play here as well, um, as in addition to obviously any resurgences that we have with COVID. 
Um, and there will be an opportunity for public comment and testimony. I've given you the link for the rulemaking so you can follow that if you wish. And um, federal, I didn't mention this, uh, I don't think, but federal OSHA's uh, regulatory agenda just came out in the last week as well. And they have an infectious disease rulemaking on their agenda. Um, and so my guess is they are not going to even think about doing a permanent COVID rule. They're gonna you know, keep their powder dry and they're gonna be moving in the direction of doing an infectious disease prevention standard. Currently, the scope of that uh, as drafted uh, is limited to the healthcare sector. Uh, but you know, there is a possibility after notice and comment at the federal level that eventually that infectious disease rule could be broadened with perhaps less stringent requirements for the non-healthcare uh, workplace settings. Uh, so what happens next with COVID? You know, we are on the precipice right now. Either everybody is gonna continue uh, to get vaccinated. We will reach that uh, point for herd immunity. This will die out and it won't be an issue anymore. Or perhaps we will have a lot of people who continue to be resistant uh, to vaccines um, and that Delta uh, variation will uh, flourish. Uh, there are some indications that even fully vaccinated people can become sick, uh, not uh, deathly ill necessarily, but the, that, that Delta variant, depending on which vaccine you've gotten, may not uh, you know, be foolproof. And if you've only had one shot, it's only about 50% effective against that variant. So um, you've got that window of time, a month or so between your first shot and then your second shot plus 14 days. That is gonna be a very vulnerable spot for people right now, since it is already here on our shores. If you get a little bit too cocky and you're going maskless inside based upon your one shot, um, you could very well get uh, that variant um, and you know end up uh, bringing it into the workplace, uh, bringing it home to your family. So please do be careful of that. Um, finally, Nevada. Um, they just issued some guidance. They, they are another state plan OSHA, um, and it applies to all businesses operating in the state. Um, took effect on uh, May 14th, 2021. Encouraging employees to get the vaccine, uh, follow the CDC guidance, but they specify, and this is important, that private entities can have more restrictive policies than what the CDC says. And that is to protect against uh, what we've seen in some of the states where they're telling employers, you can't require masks anymore. Again, that isn't what CDC guidance even said. Um, in Nevada, unvaccinated employees have to be provided with face coverings by the employer, wear them when they are in close contact with the public or where food is pro, uh, prepared, packaged or distributed. And it's not clear if warehousing and logistics uh, that store food products uh, would be covered under that. Uh, you have to wear face coverings if you're unvaccinated in common areas. Continue your housekeeping, cleaning and disinfecting. Um, conduct daily surveys of changes to labor health conditions. That means you're continuing to screen your workers. Uh, provide access to potable and sanitary water. Post signage with the latest CDC guidance. And then complete a job hazard analysis for each task in your workplace that has been identified where COVID transmission could be an immediate concern. Uh, so this is not you know, exactly toothless. And as I mentioned, when we went through that uh, June 10th guidance that federal OSHA just came out with, while they can't enforce these to the letter, if they come in following up on, on reports of COVID hazards or clusters of illnesses, uh, and they find that you've blown off all of this guidance, that would cause a position you for a citation under the Nevada OSHA's version of the general duty clause. Um, so finally, to, to kind of wrap up here, <coughs> excuse me, on vaccines, um, the EEOC updated their guidance as of May 28th. Um, and uh, there's, this is part of a rolling table of FAQs they have uh, that deal with COVID, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act, which covers uh, federal employees and federal contractors, um, and also the other uh, employment laws that are implicated, the Americans with Disabilities Act, religious rights under Title VII, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, uh, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is known as GINA. Um, 
They've clarified that federal law does not prohibit employers from requiring employees who are going to be physically there in the workplace to be fully vaccinated, um, subject to re respecting the reasonable accommodation rights of those who have religious or health uh, considerations. Uh, they clarified that requiring proof of the vaccine is not a medical exam, so it's not prohibited under the ADA and it is not uh, covered by HIPAA. Uh, but you do want to avoid looking at medical screening questionnaires, uh, especially those for taking the vaccine, because there's a laundry list of questions that people check off. Have you had cancer? You know, are you undergoing chemotherapy? You know, do you have an autoimmune disease? And if an employer is looking at those, it's going to give them information about the workers' protected health conditions, which, which confers ADA protections on them. That's one thing. Uh, but it also does provide medical information that the employer shouldn't be looking at under HIPAA. Um, so if they have their vaccine card and the questionnaire is stapled to it, have them pull that off before you make a copy if you're doing that uh, of their vaccination cards. Um, now, the reasonable accommodation for religious grounds, it's a lower level of what you have to do. Um, and if it's a burden on the employer, you can blow it off. I, I hate to say it that way, but that's how the law reads. But for a, a, a physical a, a health disability, there is a greater burden of uh, reasonably accommodating that worker. Um, and so you have to go through the individualized assessment. Uh, the EEOC says that an unvaccinated person is not per se a direct threat to safety, which is one of the affirmative defenses under the ADA. But they do say you can do an individualized assessment to determine if they would pose a risk to the health and safety of themselves themselves or others. There was a Supreme Court decision that said, even if the worker themselves is the only one placed at risk, the employer can still refuse to allow them in the workplace if that risk cannot be mitigated. Um, but having said all of that, I do recommend avoiding terminating workers or taking other adverse actions over the vaccine issue uh, because there can be additional protections at the state level, the county levels, even, you know, uh, you might not be covered, say, under the federal ADA because you have fewer than 15 employees. But if you're in Prince George's County, Maryland, they cover you against a, a discrimination, even if you have one employee. So, so don't be too quick uh, to hand out those pink slips. And also don't forget that people uh, have some rights under the Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, if they are covered by that, which means have, have worked there for 12 months, uh, worked at least 1,250 hours, and the employer has at least 50 employees, uh, they can request intermittent leave, and that may be another solution uh, uh, to accommodating workers uh, who are holding off on getting the vaccine, maybe pending additional information on trials, uh, just to use that as an example. Um, and also, uh, keep an eye on future executive orders or other changes uh, to emergency or permanent standards in the states where you do business, um, including, uh, as we've already noted, the vaccine considerations that are embedded in some of the state and federal uh, OSHA, OSHA guidance at this point. Um, also, if you're making changes on vaccine issues and decide that you are gonna mandate them, remember that that is a change in a mandated term and condition of employment. And if you are a union workplace, you're gonna need to talk it out with your uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, folks, uh, change, you know, amend your agreement or something. Otherwise, you may have to defend against an unfair labor practice charge before the National Labor Relations Board. But, you know, the vaccine rollout, you know, that, that long has happened. Uh, there's vaccine available for everybody in the U.S. who wants it at this point. Um, you need to uh, encourage workers to do it, uh, including giving them leave, um, paid leave, if they have bad side effects after the vaccine, which some people uh, need to take a day or two of leave. Um, so uh, that's a good practice. Also, if you offer it, but an employee refuses it, get them to sign a declination uh, of it, the same as you would under the bloodborne pathogen standard if they decline the hepatitis B vaccine. You can kind of use that declination form as a model. Uh, but you know, consider if workers can safely work remotely if they don't want to be vaccinated. Consider if they can work, you know, maybe in an isolated area, uh, you know, for the time being. But um, make accommodations. Look at enhanced PPE. Uh, remember, OSHA says 
that unvaccinated workers can continue to work in the workplace. They just have to continue wearing masks. And that's where the law is at this point. Um, you can also incentivize vaccines, but the EEOC said that the amount of uh, uh, incentive cannot be enough to make it coercive. So if it's under a hundred dollars, you know, uh, that's probably okay. If you get above that, that could mean, mean the difference between somebody, you know, making rent or being evicted. Um, and that could be coercive. Uh, gift cards, you know, 25 bucks, 50 bucks, that may be a good way to go. Um, so that's what we have to talk about here uh, today. Um, you know, obviously uh, on compensability of COVID cases, that is a rebuttable uh, presumption. Um, and if you can show that you've implemented all of these appropriate guidelines, that's going to make your workers' comp cases more defensible. Um, you know, uh, if you're mandating or encouraging vaccines, track which workers have gotten the vaccine, what stage they're at, initial, uh, the second shot. I think, you know, this fall, we're all going to be looking at boosters, and, and that's where the age discrimination may come into play if you have to limit people working uh, in person to those who've had the booster if they follow uh, past protocol of, of making it available to the old folks like me first. Um, in Maryland, just as an example, and DC as well, I believe, uh, age discrimination is uh, discriminating on the basis of any age, whereas the federal rule, it's discriminating against, against people who are 40 and above. So if you're discriminating against young people, it's not actionable under the federal law, but it is actionable under some of the state analogs. Um, and uh, try to have the third party providers give the vaccine if you're gonna be doing a clinic at your work site. Again, it just creates a wall between your people and health information of your workers. Uh, stay abreast of the changing guidance. Uh, keep an eye out for new executive orders. Um, and remember that work refusal, uh, the refusal to perform a hazardous job um, is embedded in uh, the Section 11C rights and Section 105C of the Mine Act, but also under President Biden's executive order from January, if you refuse to do a hazardous job because of COVID, you are entitled to unemployment insurance compensation. So uh, that's another little complicating factor that you have to consider. Uh, so I know I went uh, all the way to the bottom here, uh, but I am happy to stay on and answer questions. I'm sure we have a few out there. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Adele. My name is Debbie Jennings. I work for Chesapeake Region Safety Council, and I'm here to forward on the questions that came from all of you all during this uh, seminar. Um, before we do that, um, I would like to say that if you are interested in attending our 98th annual meeting, that is next Friday, and you will see Adele there. And we're looking forward to uh, having that occur. Okay, let's get to the questions. Um, some of them maybe uh, may have been already covered, but I tried to weed those out. Let's see, first one, how does an employer prove or disprove when and how an employee contracts COVID? Isn't it difficult for either party to absolutely prove when that was contractor, contracted, contacted? And should an employer require um, or just record all of them? And does the recording open an employer up to issues with insurance coverage if numerous cases occur, even if no proof by employees that COVID was contracted at work? Hey, there's, a whole, there, there's a whole webinar on that question. Um, okay, how, first of all, um, do you have to record, should you record them all? I would say no, <laughs> because, uh, you know, you are uh, creating a presumption then that you're doing nothing on COVID and it's running rampant through your workplace. You do want to carefully consider each case, but you got to be honest about it. I mean, if it looks like they caught it at your workplace, you know, they live alone, they, you know, they, they, there's a route of exposure in the workplace. They uh, don't report uh, that they've had any contact with infected people outside of the workplace. And maybe there's a cluster, say, you know, at this one area of a conveyor belt where three people are working together and one of them was positive. And then, you know, a few days later, uh, all three of them have symptoms. That's something you're going to look at and say, yeah, that, that probably is work related. Uh, in the healthcare sector, obviously, 
uh, it's probably more likely than not that they would acquire it. Uh, uh, so it's going to be a case by case individualized determination, except in California, where you have to assume that it is work related if there's any possible route of transmission. Uh, but for the other states, that is not uh, how they're doing it. And then, uh, you know, the fact that you put cases on the log, does that mean that they are compensable? The answer to that is no. Um, in fact, the OSHAC makes it very clear, Congress made it very clear that nothing that federal OSHA does is to interfere with any state workers' comp system. There are, you know, long history of examples where things are, have to be recordable by, for OSHA, but they're not compensable. There are things that are compensable, but they're not recordable. Um, so don't confuse the two. Um, and as far as your insurance company, I'm just going to say, I mean, whether they're put on your OSHA log or not, you know, if you have a, a ton of people who are filing for workers' comp uh, based on COVID, uh, the insurance company is going to take a look at what you're doing, I would think. And if you have no programs in place, uh, I imagine they could consider dropping you or raising your premiums. Uh, so uh, if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> let me put it that way. If you don't know what you're doing, bring in a safety professional who does and help them and get them to let them help you put a program in place. You know, um, OSHA does have consultative services, but I think they're kind of limited right now because they're stretched pretty thin. Um, and, you know, coming in and doing, you know, a, an audit for, for COVID, you're probably not going to be uh, getting a free one from OSHA uh, and their consultants anytime soon. But there are, you know, a bunch of uh, safety professionals out there, uh, you know, who would be happy to come in and who may have unique knowledge of your uh, type of work. Uh, if maybe you're working in four states and they have four different programs, you're going to need somebody who really understands how to implement that. Uh, and harmonize those programs to do what I recommend, which is have across the board a, a, a program that is benchmarked to the most stringent standard because you cannot afford lesser levels of protection to some of your workers just because of a, a artificial geographical boundary. Um, you know, that is inviting litigation. It's inviting hazard complaints. Thank you. We have a few um, in reference to the healthcare standard. The first one is, does the standard apply to personnel uh, such as equipment and facilities, staff, housekeeping, et cetera? And then the other one is, it is agency-wide, agencies that provide support services to people with developmental disabilities do, and including in-home healthcare services yeah. and nursing care. Does the healthcare standard apply to them as well? Yeah, th this is a little bit of a wild card. Uh, when I went uh, through that, I did have enumerated the, the facilities that were definitely covered under this uh, based upon OSHA's uh, guidance sheet. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, the support staff, uh, they don't have, if, they, if they're not working directly with patients, they would be at a lower level of risk. And uh, the rule does require you uh, you know, to do uh, some of that triage on the on the positions we talked about the COVID plan, um, determining the workplace hazard assessment uh, to determine which what is the risk of transmission to your different employees. Uh, those who are working directly with patients are going to be the ones at highest risk. Uh, if you're, you know, a cafeteria worker in the hospital and you're only working in the kitchen, you're probably not going to be at risk. And therefore, those those heightened precautions would would likely not apply to you. And I say likely because they don't have all the guidance out on this yet. Um, you know, conversely, if you are an orderly and you're bringing the meals to the patients uh, in the ICU, you are at risk there because you are going into patient rooms, and so you would be treated differently. And then you know you'd have to look okay organizationally. How does that orderly get that food? You know, do they have to go to the cafeteria to get it, or are there trays with meals that are wheeled up to the floor and then they get it off there? If they have to go into the cafeteria, suddenly the, the cafeteria staff may have exposure as well. So this is a lot more complicated, really, you know, than it seems at first blush. Uh, but um, the home health care, I know you mentioned that, that is specifically listed as being one of the enumerated categories where this would apply. Um, and if you're working in the home healthcare setting, 
with the, the, you know, the, easy for me to say, developmentally disabled individuals rather than physically sick patients, then you're going to have to determine, you know, what is the likelihood that they are uh, suspected uh, of having exposure to COVID. Um, if they are kept in the, the in the house 24/7 and the only people who come in and out are the healthcare workers, that risk may be low. Um, but if they are somebody with mental illness who go to day programs, you know, at a uh, a group group, uh, you know, like kind of adult daycare off-site facility then yes, they, they do have COVID exposure potentially. And so I would say those visiting uh, healthcare professionals uh, probably would have to adhere to this standard. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions that I'm going to combine together. The first is, uh, when do companies have to be compliant with the federal OSHA standard? And then the next one is, will there be a national vac vaccination validation system? Okay, um, when they have to be uh, 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 in compliance with this, uh, some provisions, it's going to be, uh, I, I think it was uh, 15 days from when it was published in the Federal Register. I had that on the earlier slide. Um, and then the training, the partitions, and a few of the other provisions, you have 30 days from when it appears in the Federal Register. And in terms of a national vaccination validation system, I think the ship has sailed on that because so many of us, you know, got the little cardboard cards that are so easily uh, counterfeited. Um, and they did not really keep a database uh, on who got what. Uh, but if we have another round of this and maybe there has to be a different vaccine, I think uh, the, the, the uh, feds will have learned from this experience and how difficult it is now for employers to validate who has a bona fide vaccine and who's faking it. Um, and I would expect that they, you know, because this would be started, you know, under under a new administration, uh, they would have a chance to do a reset on that. Uh, perhaps they will do that, in fact, you know, for the booster uh, shots, if we do all have to have boosters starting in September or October. Um, so stay tuned on that. But I don't work for the government, so I don't I don't have any say uh, in what they're going to do on, on the National Registry. Okay. Um... Here's one. Um, is there an advantage to HR departments not asking employees if they've gotten vaccinated? Um, well, the advantage is that, uh, you know, they, they, they avoid, you know, employees getting kicked off about it, maybe, uh, you know, or a, a confrontation about, you know, my rights, my body, you know, uh, the whole I, I identify as vaccinated thing. Uh, but Right now, the way all of these rules are written, you know, after everything you've heard me say, an employer has to either know who is vaccinated or they have to treat the entire workforce as unvaccinated, which means we're back to everybody being masked, everybody socially distancing, um, except we're rescinded using partitions, engineering controls, uh, you know, the whole shebang. So, there, I don't see any advantage to an employer for not asking, really. Conversely, the more people that they can 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 validate as being uh, vaccinated, uh, the less burdensome uh, the requirements will be for them in terms of complying with OSHA. Okay. Um, this is under the VOSH uh, permanent standard. Are health care screenings still necessary? Yes, it, it, it appears that they are. Okay. Um, if we have a split workforce, can we require all workers to continue to wear face coverings and social distance? Um, well, it's going to be state by state, but, um, you know, as, as I usually uh, say in a different context, uh, nobody gets cited by OSHA for going beyond minimum compliance. And so um, at least some of the states have specifically said that uh, private employers can go beyond the minimum requirements. You can require masks to continue to be used. Uh, so I don't see any legal problem with that at the present. Now, you know, if Governor Hogan in Maryland breaks bad and goes the way that California, that Texas has and says, we're not going to allow people to wear masks, you know, that's a different story. I think that would be pretty foolish for him to do. Uh, but I certainly don't see uh, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, you know, uh, going in that direction, West Virginia, who the heck knows? Uh, but 
you know, for, for at this point, you know, DC, I don't think any employer is going to get in trouble if they if they mandate masks uh, just to be on the safe side. Okay. Um, would a drug treatment center fall under the OSHA ETS if they have provisions to screen and test new patients prior to admission and therefore do not treat COVID-19 patients? I would say yes, um, because it is still a healthcare facility and just looking, you know, uh, at, at what they talk about here, uh, you know, there's still the potential for somebody to be positive. We just saw this with the, uh, the uh, cruise line that did their, their test cruise. They screened all of their crew before they got on the boat. And at the end of the cruise, they had eight crew members who were positive for COVID and they had never gotten off the boat. Uh, so the fact that you screen negative uh, does not mean that the person, you know, maybe is still incubating it. Um, so I don't think that you could say with any certainty, we're not admitting COVID patients, so we don't have to abide by any of these recommendations. You know, having said that, I'm sure there's going to be a rehab facility that's going to, you know, push back on that or ask for clarification. Um, and this is the kind of thing that OSHA sometimes does issue letters of interpretation about, um, you know, the things that kind of fall fall into another region of, you know, it's not quite a hospital, but it certainly isn't like, you know, a voluntary, you know, uh, you know, uh, urgent care center or, or something where people are, it's not an AA meeting, you know, you're spending time there, you're, you're, you're in bed, you're being treated by healthcare professionals. Um, so I think that that would be, would fall under the rule at this point. Okay. Um, another one, if an employer gives employees N95s, are they required to go through a fit test and med evaluation? If they give them an N95, to me, they are now wearing that as a, they are now wearing a respirator. And so in order for that to be effective, they would need to first have a medical evaluation to make sure it's safe for them to wear. I mean, the worst thing is you give somebody an N95 and it complicates, you know, a pulmonary condition that they have. That's why we do fit testing um, and or assuming the medical evaluation. And then the fit testing is to make sure they have the right size and fit for their face because, you know, they're not one size fits all. But also, as I mentioned, the shaving issue, OSHA says one day, of manly growth is all that you're allowed in order to have a, a good fit, a good seal on the N95. Um, so if somebody is asking for an N95 versus the plain cloth face covering, it's because they feel they're at heightened risk. And therefore, if you're giving them the N95, they need to wear it properly. Um, now, if they're wearing it for comfort, the other thing is, um, does this implicate having to post the Appendix D, like a dog from uh, the respirator standard, 1910.134. Uh, uh, um, that's something I would look into as well before giving out N95s uh, just for the heck of it. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, most of them involve uh, asking you to elaborate on what's going to happen with the Virginia permanent standard after June 30th or the Maryland removal of the state of emergency that's coming well, up. Yeah, I mean, you know, all I would be doing is guessing. Um, as we talked about, uh, Virginia is looking at what's happening. Um, we're seeing all these other states uh, that have uh, rescinded provisions based upon the new guidance. And I think Virginia will follow suit. Uh, you know, Cal, Cal OSHA is gonna be a, a fairly powerful uh, leader in this, especially because the head of federal OSHA comes from there. Um, and so I think, you know, Virginia is probably gonna look at Cal OSHA. They're gonna look at the changes, you know, Oregon OSHA just made, Michigan OSHA just made, uh, and likely follow suit. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. I, th I think, you know, they're going to, I mean, we're all kind of in shock because all of this stuff, you know, hit us in a way. First, boom, the CDC guidance, and boom, the new OSHA guidance, you know, the federal OSHA guidance, and the emergency standard. And I've done my best here over the last almost two hours to try to help make sense out of this, uh, you know, changing landscape that we have. 
Uh, but Virginia has protocols they have to go through. They have to have meetings before they can just arbitrarily change that rule. Um, and you know, there's public input that they'll be, be getting as well. Okay, um, so once again, Adele, you have so much information and you share it seamlessly. Um, I, I treasure listening to these and we really appreciate it um, here at Chesapeake Region Safety Council for your time. Dave Medeiros just popped up with his screen on and just gave you the big thumbs up. <laughs> We're looking forward to seeing you next week, uh, Friday at our annual meeting and award ceremony. If anybody still wants to register, there's a little bit of time for that. And if questions continue to come in, we'll get them to you, Adele. Um, and everybody great. have a wonderful Friday. Thank you, Adele. Thank you very much. It was a, I don't know. There's not enough in my cranium to hold all that stuff, but it was good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity and, uh, to present this information. And if anyone does have follow-up questions, because I know, you know, uh, I, I did I did a, a preview version of this yesterday uh, without the new Calosha information and uh, the, the uh, person from that association described it as being hit with a fire hose of information. So uh, I know that I may have knocked some of you down, but you can email me at safetylawyer at gmail.com. I'm happy to answer questions one on one. So uh, please do let me know if you uh, have any questions or need assistance. And oh. everybody, please be safe, stay well. Thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, this presentation and Adele's PowerPoint will be on our LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter feeds, as well as YouTube by, uh, I would say, Monday morning, probably before. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>